Good morning, and thank you all for joining today's webinar, Celebrating Daffodils. I'm Vanessa Sellers, the director of the New York Botanical Gardens Humanities Institute. And together with my colleague, Charles Zimmerman, the Herbarium Collections and Outreach Administrator, it is my great pleasure to welcome you from locations across the United States and around the world. At any time during today's event, please feel welcome to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window, and we will raise these for our speakers to answer at the end. Live captions can be enabled by clicking the CC button, then show subtitles or view full transcript. Now, I am delighted to give the word to Brian Sullivan, the Vivian and Edward Marin Vice President for Glasshouses and Landscape at the New York Botanical Garden, who will introduce today's speakers. Brian. Thank you, Vanessa. Welcome, everyone. This morning, we'll dive into daffodils. It is my great pleasure to honor and honor to introduce two horticultural specialists, Sarah Van Beck and Claire Lyman. Together, they will reveal the history the propagation and the preservation of Narcissus. They will also look at current challenges relating to gardening trends, the lack of precise taxonomy, and the impact of climate change on growing these beloved bulbs. Their presentation will be followed by a conversation that will also focus on the New York Botanical Garden's own rare historic daffodil cultivars. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to share an update on the daffodils at the garden today. This morning in the cold temperatures, I visited all the garden's daffodil collections, including Daffodil Hill and Lyason Valley. Many early cultivars are already in flower. The rest with leaves and buds emerging are not far behind. The display looks poised to be at the peak in the third week of April. If you are in the area, I encourage you to visit soon there's really nothing like a walk through the daffodils on a sunny day in spring. Our first speaker is Sarah Van Beck, a renowned horticulturist, historian, and avid gardener. Sarah is widely regarded as one of America's foremost daffodil authorities. She is chair of the Historics Committee of the American Daffodil Society, where she established the Display Garden Program. She serves on the Acquisitions Committee of the Cherokee Garden Library at the Atlanta History Center and is also a corresponding member of the Royal Horticultural Society's Narcissus Classification Advisory Group. Sarah worked as a museum curator with the National Park Service and is the former president of the Georgia Daffodil Society. An avid writer, Sarah's Daffodils in American Gardens, 1733 to 1940, is considered the premier work on the history and cultivation of Narcissus. Following Sarah will be Claire Lyman, the Assistant Curator for Outdoor Gardens at the New York Botanical Garden, where she helps develop, document, and interpret the garden's hardy plant collections. Over the past several years, Claire has been digging into the origins of NYBG's daffodil collection and has done some remarkable work to identify many of the garden's heirloom cultivars. Claire holds a degree in plant biology from the University of Washington, where she taught plant systematics and identification. She also collaborated with the US Forest Service in Washington Rare Plant Care and Conservation on determining plant hybridization through in situ population assessment and a common garden study. Here now is Sarah. Good day. So give me a moment, please. There we go. To understand what one finds now, one needs a basic understanding of what went before. So this is going to be an easy peasy breezy history of daffodils in American gardens to set the stage for what one finds currently uh, that represents lost genetic repositories and lost cultivars to um, 
general commerce. So daffodils in American gardens go back to the colonial era, uh, both from English colonists and German. And they fall into two general groups, those which were for vernacular gardens or common folk, our general colonists, and those of the gentry set who had the finances to purchase from England uh, or the education to trade with friends. And the commoners daffodils are those that we still know today and still think of as sort of backbench stalwart flowers. Uh, Pseudonarcissus, uh, if you look at the bottom, is the first one on the left. It's the little yellowy Wordsworth trumpet. Poeticus, very common towards the north. Uh, it is an alpine flower. It needs more cold, so we don't see it in the south, but it's very common in the north. Medialudius is the twin sisters or uh, primrose peerless, which dates back to the 1500s in England, uh, often referred to. The wealthier folks went with those flowers that were considered uh, more fashionable. The ones that were fashionable were those that were big, showy, and smelled good. So these were not only for the garden, but they were also for indoor forcing. The most favorite of the group, uh, sometimes referred to as polyanthus narcissus, are referred to now as pizettas, uh, their sectional name in the genus Narcissus. And they were the province of the Dutch. The English could never quite get to Zetas to go, grow for them. And so they always just left it as the domain of the Dutch. Jonquils became great favorites starting in the 1500s when the Catholics were able to kick the Moors out of Spain and open the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, up for flower explorers. And they came back with jonquils and they were an immediate hit for their delightful fragrance. And the third that were favorites, but they were sort of the bottom tier flowers, were doubles. Uh, even when the gentry set did have flowers, they did not have many. They were still a luxurious expense. They were a bit frivolous. So, you know, people might order 50 or 100, but they may, they're not ordering vast quantities like we think of today. So how people planted their daffodils sort of reflects where their uh, status was in life. And the well-to-do would plant them in their parterre gardens uh, or formal beds. Uh, William Logan of Stenton, uh, the slide on the, excuse me, on the left, uh, this is a recreation of his original garden design. And this is a summation of some of the things in one of his orders uh, to England. Even though people ordered Dutch bulbs, they still had to go on British ships because England was still trying to control the colonists' wealth and uh, tax just about everything that went into the colonies. And you can see down towards the bottom, you have this direction about how to transport the plants in the boxes so the mice don't eat them and the salt water doesn't kill them. Uh, it took three months and a lot of can happen in three months, most of it not good. The Moravian settlement of Old Salem, which is uh, still a, a well-known historic site today, presents an interesting uh, case study in what off-the-boat colonists were doing with their flowers. The Moravians are interesting because they were a very insular religious sect. They did not um, interact much with other colonists. They kept to themselves. So the fact that they had daffodils, they were not turning around and buying things from their English speaking neighbors. They were communicating amongst themselves between the uh, parent colonies and the satellite colonies. So the flowers and the seeds and everything else and the people all came from the mother colonies, which came over from Saxony. So presumably the pseudonarcissus that were planted in a little corner of the otherwise very large vegetable garden were bulbs that somehow made their way over from Germany. The antebellum period uh, is what most people are a little bit more familiar with. And at this point, daffodils started to really kind of take a back seat, except for parlor flowering, because people were desperate to have flowers in their homes uh, through the winter season. And daffodils were definitely part of that repository. Uh, the common folk uh, had their vernacular gardens. Uh, which basically vernacular is uh, basically common people's gardens. So their little plot of ground, 
Uh, they may or may not try to emulate what the uh, wealthy are doing, um, but they're oftentimes just carrying on the very simple traditions that they brought with them from England or Ireland or Germany. And then high style are the folks with money who are reading the horticultural trade journals and magazines and uh, going to Europe and seeing what the Europeans are doing and coming home and trying to do it themselves because we are keeping up with the Joneses. Daffodils are an interesting um, plant in that what is planted where is a reflection of socioeconomic status. And so looking at how things were planted and what was planted gives you a sense of where what a gardener was really doing in a greater, greater sense, even if other plant material doesn't survive, daffodils can be a marker that gives you some idea of what that original gardener was doing. But parlor gardening uh, went from, say, November, December through May, and tazettas and jonquils and some doubles and other standards were very much uh, purchased for forcing. And by the late uh, antebellum period, which becomes high Victorian in England, we start with these fancy, what we now call lasagna plantings, where you bought um, intricate basket work, you stacked your bulbs, and you made very fancy little floral arrangements to go in your parlor. These are sort of the, um, some of the catalogs that people would be ordering from, and what people ordered when becomes an interesting um, rabbit hole that I have spent some real time in the past two years, which we will circle back round to. But on the left is a 1920s, uh, excuse me, an 1827 catalog uh, from one of the premier Dutch houses, firms of Prelog. I will not attempt my Dutch. Uh, and the center column is primarily Tazetas. The Bar and Sugden catalog on the right is 1866, and this starts the beginning of the daffodil renaissance in England. And you can notice sort of a difference in the number of varieties that were offered. It's actually quite large. Also a change in names, uh, which reflects a, an evolution into set of hybridizing, which becomes another interesting rabbit hole uh, later. This is a premier example of a vernacular dooryard garden. This was in the, uh, taken around the turn of the century uh, in the mountains of Georgia. But as far back as uh, Bartram, John Bartram, uh, in the colonial period, he made a comment about uh, railing in a little bed for his Dutch bulbs. And this is what they meant by railing. This goes back to the 1500s. It's simply having wood boards to create a flower bed. Uh, these dooryard gardens were very common in New England and kept on sort of as a, as a um, familial way of gardening. Uh, how people planted in their vernacular gardens varied with traditions. Uh, so you have different traditions, say, from North Carolina to Georgia to Virginia and further north. And as colonists traveled west, they took these gardening traditions with them. When we say high style, we mean high style. This uh, stereo view is from upstate New York, about 1869, based on the history of the photography studio and the fact that those poor women are still wearing hoop skirts. Um, and if you look closely at the base where the folks are standing along the edge of that inner circle, you'll see plant, 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 plant. And those are tulips. So they had the money to buy tulips, but they were still a rare and precious commodity and they were planted spaced out so you could appreciate each single bloom. These parterre gardens varied in styles, um, but this uh, traditional bullseye pattern goes back to medieval Europe and the cloisters and the monasteries. After the Civil War begins this renaissance in daffodils, a gentleman by the name of Peter Barr decides that he loves daffodils and he's going to make everybody else love daffodils. Daffodils uh, were, were roundly despised by one of the most important uh, garden patronesses in England at the time. She had decreed that no daffodil would ever be planted on any of her estates. So he had a tough row to hoe to convince everybody that these daffodils were worth planting. What Peter Barr had done was run around and scarf up every collection of amateur hybridizer 
that he could find that folks in the starting in the 18 teens, 1820s, uh, when amateur botany became a de rigueur method of pursuing science, uh, a few folks got into hybridizing daffodils, trying to ascertain the structure of the genus Narcissus. And then they went on to just produce hybrids because they were pretty. And Peter Barr knew of these people and he started collecting them. And then he would trot down to the Royal Horticulture Society meetings every two weeks and bring in boxes of new flowers. Daffodils at the time were the same old flowers everybody had been looking at for the past couple of hundred years. And here comes Peter Barr with a box of new colors and new forms and new bloom times. And it didn't take long for the English to become quite smitten with daffodils. One of the, if you have a new flower, you have to have a way for people to use it. And so it was hit upon very early about having daffodils out front for uh, your visitors to see. So they became planted along the carriage lines. And so the wealthy would buy these daffodils in large number to plant along the carriage drives. Well, many people did not have carriage drives. They did not own that much land, but they could in adapt daffodils to the uh, fashionable method of planting of ribbon planting, uh, where the English had hit upon this as a way to enjoy all the bright, brilliant foliage plants and bedding plants. And, the, and people said, oh, well, we can do that in daffodils. So whereas Oakton is an, a standing extant original 1870s planting, Muscle Shoals is an 1870s planting of taking a, an antebellum parterre design and updating it with bulbs in the ribbon planting style. So this was a very unique method of parterre planting. It has a lot of Irish symbolism of love and marriage. And when the daughter took over the garden, she updated it, kept her mother's bed design, but added bulbs as in a ribbon design to modernize, as it were, make, plant a fashionable garden. And her sister, who married and moved uh, across the county, made a similar garden, although it was a new garden and she did not include the, the Irish symbolism of her mother. She used some of the same plants. And so there is this parallel development of these two daughters' gardens of using, the, using daffodils in this new ribbon design. The later Victorian method of planting daffodils is one we are quite familiar with because it's just the best way to do it. And that is the wild garden uh, mantra of William Robinson promoted by Gertrude Jekyll, where you plant them by the bucket load out in the lawn. So the tulips became the domain of the formal garden near the house. And the daffodils went out in the grasslands, the hillsides, along the fence lines to be enjoyed from afar or by stroll. So on the left, we have Winterthur, planted 1902, which is about four years after the uh, New York Botanic Garden planting began. And on the right, we have a planting in a uh, rural community of East Georgia, where the um, mistress of the house, the family matriarch, died in 1913. So we're thinking that she did this about 1910. And these, uh, her lawn is about 300 yards long and 100 yards wide. People found that they could uh, implement their own sense of how they were going to plant. Did they want a color scheme? Did they want a color palette that changed? Did they want accent bulbs for a little bit of blue, a little bit of white, lacogem, muscari, violets? So, and in the sometimes in the fall they could plant fall bulbs, so they had a double season. These different garden styles and different planting times, in the end, be, have become repositories of bulbs since lost to commerce or simply even lost to collections. So these are a few gardens that I've worked at personally where I found things that I am now working on either trying to get out to trying to get identified 
or trying to get back into commerce because they offer um, some traits that modern daffodils don't necessarily have. Top of the list is intestinal fortitude. And that intestinal fortitude rolls into the second, which is heat tolerance, which is becoming more and more important with climate change. The flower land was planted in 1930, 1940 for its first iteration. It is an estate on the outskirts of North Atlanta. It is on a very steep embankment. And when the property was converted into condos, because it was on an important creek, an important creek side, it was put under conservation easement. Interestingly, flowers that were very common in the 1920s and 1930s uh, that became sort of the dominant flowers because of the bulb quarantine in, resp in response to Dutch um, elm disease that was imposed on bulbs in 1926. Keep cultivars that after World War II were promptly dropped like a rock because everybody was tired of looking at them and they wanted the big new thing. One of these old flowers that was dropped was called circlet. I've not been able to find circlet in any catalog. There's only one photograph of it in one book. And here comes circlet. It is very early. It is very tall. It makes a great cut flower. It has staying power. It looks like a poet with its delicate little red ring, but because it's very early season, it has a much wider uh, possibility in terms of where it can be planted. So it can be planted down into, I would suspect zone 8A. And because it's early, it doesn't get as whacked by early uh, heat waves, which of course now you guys are having early um, ice storms or late ice storms, but be that as it may, this earliness gives it a plasticity that I think really is will be important for breeding back into current daffodil hybridizing. Uh, Tesaurus, uh, another one that's been lost to commerce. Uh, this one will be getting sent out this year, uh, was just identified this spring. It oftentimes throws two florets to a stem, which is interesting to hybridizers. It has a beautiful salmon pink that is hard to come by. And with its uh, floriferousness and its robust um, nature that it's still holding on and multiplying well as a small bulb, uh, upwards of 90 years after it was planted, says something for the uh, robustness of the plant that it might have some uh, good genes to offer. Red Cross was described in one catalog as famous across the daffodil world because it was one of the best saturated yellow oranges of its day. It was promptly surpassed by the 1950s by newer varieties, but Red Cross is a very durable, durable plant. And it's a hard col uh, color combination to get durable flowers into more southern climates. Alcida is another one that uh, is not represented in European collections currently. Uh, again, it may not look so great on the right. Those are the ones from Atlanta in a heat wave. The ones on the left are from St. Louis in much better weather. But the fact that this very colorful, medium-sized flower with an interesting poise is blooming in a 80-some degree heat wave in early March in Atlanta, again, suggests a robustness that ought to be revisited re uh, by hybridizers. In the 1920s, people began, as daffodils became popular, florists started their own little cut flower patches to sell daffodil stems either by train to the northern market or to downtown to their own metro. So this is a, a small little cut flower operation, uh, what is now downtown or near downtown Atlanta, but right near a trolley line. So Arthur Floyd, um, excuse me, Arthur Ward could go and pick his stems early, uh, put them on the trolley, take them downtown and sell them. So the common flowers of the 1920s, again, were quickly surpassed once better things came on the market. But there's some cute little darlings to be had, and butterfly is one of them. So hoping to get butterfly back on the specialty market, it's not something that I think would uh, appeal to people who want something the size of a tulip to replace uh, tulips in the current market. But for specialty uh, daffodil folks who like that wild, willowy wildflower look, she's a doll.
Magnolia Vale um, is a special case all unto its own. Uh, it was a famous garden in the 1840s that had its own whistle stop on the Mississippi River. <clears throat> it was kept in family, it's actually, I believe, still in family hands, and the garden itself lasted well into the 1900s. On the uh, left, there's a big blue arrow, that's daffodil foliage. So you notice those railed beds, again, use, simply using boards, and daffodils to line the beds. All that is left of Magnolia Vale are those daffodils and tazettas on the embankment of the Mississippi River. And at this point, even those are gone due to the catastrophic floods of the past 10 years. For the past, I went in 2010, 2015, and again in 2020, and dug all the different looking foliage I could find, hoping to find bicolor tazettas. There, the world is full of paper whites. I was looking for gold, and gold I did find. These are various blooming dates. You can see the wide variety of flower form and color combination. Uh, the flower that is blooming on November 15th with that strong reflex, I have never seen anything like it before in my life. The foliage is very different. It's a huge plant by uh, that blooming date. The leaves were three and a half feet long, completely different. I believe it is a species. I, Early on, the Dutch would simply, the vendors, the bulb houses uh, would simply go to people they knew in Algeria or the Levant and, or even central southern Italy and say, hey, I want X number of yada yada. And folks would have gone out back up the mountain to their favorite field and simply dug wild plants that looked like whatever everybody thought was the white yellow or the white orange or, or what have you. And then they'd sell them to the representatives who take them back to the houses and then they would go in the catalogs and be sold. And I believe that's what November 15th here, which a friend of mine dubbed Amber Star. <clears throat> I believe that's what that represents. January 25th, I believe is a late Dutch hybrid uh, for the second or third wave of Tazetta hybridizing by the Dutch. Uh, in the 1850s to 1860s, you can see what kind of evolution of form they were <clears throat> in terms of color combinations and strength of the corona and the size of the floret. Uh, <clears throat> January 21st on this page, again, another uh, late recent hybrid Dutch flower. She's beautiful. Oh, she has poise. She, she just glows. She's an elegant thing. I believe she might actually be an old cultivar called Queen of the Netherlands. Most of the rest of these, I don't have a name for. Uh, December 28th, I'm hoping might be an older one named Prince von Metternich. It matches the one good description I was able to find from 1907. And the bottom right one, the little cute thing with the little button type uh, flowers and that little corona, I believe might actually be yet another wild species uh, dug off the side of a mountain or from a field. There are a couple of very similar tazettas like this, slight different blooming times and discussing with other people who are familiar with tazettas and how the Dutch operated and how bulb hunters operated. We're sort of thinking that it's representative of going to an, a location and digging year to year and getting um, slight variations in a species population. Um, January 25th looks like a ho-hum flower. That is by far the largest tazetta I have ever seen. It is massive. First bloom, they came out at 55 millimeters. It has great thick substance um, and the coronas fade to white. It starts out as soft lemon and fades to white. Um, so looking at a photo from 1900 where you just have a plant, a plant, a plant, a plant. One would never envision the range of flower forms and bloom times that actually graced that estate um, and that now has been lost. Now we're looking at the same five or six old cultivars. They all look the same. They've all been culled to the ones that look good on the show bench and they're boring and they don't smell good. And these guys are fabulous. They may not multiply well, 
They may not present well for a modern show bench, but they have great presence in the garden, they last, and they have great fragrance. So I thought folks might be interested in where they might see period garden plantings that are open to the public. Uh, these are some places that you can go that are open. And then down at the bottom, if you're interested in looking at some of these catalogs uh, that I relied upon to start to piece together the history of what happened when, or to um, simply do some more background reading, uh, there are two uh, sites. The Merch Library has scads and scads of wonderful catalogs that are scanned. And then Deaf Library has a different set of uh, catalogs and other reference material, other books, uh, Google Book links, things like that. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for that fascinating, breezy overview of the historical <laughs> daffodils, the cultivars, and the gardens today. Uh, there will be questions, but we'll gather them and discuss them after the next presentation. And our next presenter is Claire Lyman. Claire, as Brian pointed out, has been doing uh, innovative research analyzing the, the New York Botanical Garden's own historic daffodils and made some important new discoveries about these rare cultivars. Welcome, Claire. Hi, thank you. Let me just share my screen. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Claire Lyman. I'm the Assistant Curator for Outdoor Gardens at NYBG. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our historic daffodil collection and the project that I've been working on. So in line with what Sarah was talking about in her presentation, uh, NYBG is definitely a repository for these old cultivars of Narcissus and potentially ones that have been lost to commerce and cultivation. So I've been working on documenting this near century old collection on Daffodil Hill and the surrounding area for the last few years. And our two main hurdles with this project have been the style of planting being naturalized, which yes, it is beautiful, uh, but it makes it incredibly difficult to keep track of things. And also uh, it was not formally recorded or accessioned. So normally we assign plants what's called an accession number when they enter the collections. And basically what that is, is an ID number that links to a formal record of that plant. You know, that way we can easily keep track of its source, its health, the location it was planted, the quantity and other bits of information. So in this image, you can see two pages from our original accession log books from 1898. You can see accession numbers, the names of the plants received, uh, the source, Peter Barr, uh, the date 1898 and an abbreviation of their destined location in the garden. And this is all wonderful, but but uh, nothing in this naturalized planting was actually added to these books. So for the majority of its existence from 1924 to about the 1990s, we really have no formal planting records. We don't know what was put in there. So the work that I have been doing is trying to figure out what daffodils were planted in this enormous time gap and um, investigate to see what still remains today. Luckily though, for us, it was a really popular feature at the garden in the early 1900s. And consequently, there were a lot of articles, you know, waxing poetic about this beautiful collection, uh, both through NYBG and outside publications. And surprisingly, it actually provided a lot of helpful information. Um, one example uh, were the narcissus featured in NYBG's Addisonia. The Addisonia was a quarterly publication from 1916 to 1964 that was dedicated to featuring plants flowering in the New York Botanical Garden. It featured high quality botanical illustrations, uh, botanical technical descriptions, and discussions by well-known authorities. Uh, like this one featured here uh, about Narcissus Queen of the North, which was written by Mrs. Wheeler Peckham, who was the honorary curator of Narcissus at NYBG at the time. There were eight narcissists featured in the Addisonia, and they were all mentioned to be a part of this collection. And it all had pieces of information like where they were planted in the collection and what other daffodils they were planted among. So with little pieces of information like that, we've actually been able to stitch together um, a bit of a skeleton record, better than nothing. 
Um, we've always known that there were some legacy daffodils from the original plantings, but we didn't know what they were or how many of them there were. So in the true spirit of working backwards with not much to go on, uh, the first thing we did was take photos of everything in the collection that was discernibly unique and try to establish a ballpark estimate of how many mystery daffodil cultivars were actually out there under our noses. You know, ultimately to determine if this would be worth the time and effort of cataloging. Well, it ended up being uh, quite a lot. Um, to put things into perspective, this is what we were expecting to find, about 36, you know, give or take a few. And this is what we found. Um, as of 2020, we've counted more than 120 unique daffodils, including the contemporary cultivars. So that is 85, 85 unique daffodils beyond what we were expecting to find. And we expect that number will continue to change as the cataloging efforts move forward. I mean, just this week I went out and I found potentially 30 more trumpet varieties that were all discernibly unique. And I hadn't caught them in years uh, previous because I just missed their blooming window. So we've been able to identify some of these mystery historic daffodils, but the majority are yet unknown. And as you can all imagine, the identifying process is complicated when you don't have planting records of any kind. Um, but the one thing that is immensely helpful, and as Sarah mentioned before, is orienting yourself and understanding what the daffodil market was like at the time. So you know what daffodils uh, were being offered, uh, what the institution had access to, and what we were likely purchasing for this collection. You know, some historic daffodils left a really big impression in the bulb industry and were therefore very well documented with a number of helpful photos and descriptions and old archived uh, bulb catalogs that were left behind for us to use as comparison. And by taking advantage of that, we've been able to identify a number of our specimens, such as Will Scarlet, Conspicuous, Firebrand, Sir Watkin, White Lady, St. Olaf, Yellow Cheerfulness, and others. The lesser known varieties, uh, however, can be a huge pain because there's less documentation, um, likely because they weren't as popular or were surpassed by other superior varieties on the market. And you know, part of the reality of this project is there will be a number of daffodils that we probably won't ever be able to claim with any level of certainty that we know what they are, but we will keep trying. And it's always helpful to get outsider input, especially you know, from people who work with historic daffodil collections and have actually laid eyes on um, cultivars that there aren't many photos that exist on the internet out there or in archives. So while identifying efforts are always ongoing, this year the effort is to map these historic daffodils so that we can monitor, manage, and preserve them better now and for the future. And I'm hoping that it will look a little something like this, where we have the whole Narcissus collection mapped out in yellow and the historics sectioned off in orange like this. And this isn't, this is just a rendering. We haven't actually started mapping yet. That's next week's problem. Um, but this will be a huge help for us moving forward, you know, um, so that we can be more mindful in future uh, planting efforts, but also so that we can revisit these historic cultivars um, narrow down the area of which we would have to look to find them again. So that's all that I have for you guys. And I just want to finish by saying that this has been a really fun project to work on, and I'm really looking forward to giving this collection the voice it deserves. So not only that future horticulturists have the tools and information that we didn't, um, but so that this beautiful and charismatic collection doesn't disappear for another century or so. Um, and if you're interested to read more about the project that I've been working on in a little bit more detail, um, I'll drop a couple of links in the chat for you to explore. But uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a remarkable presentation. It's so exciting to see what's going on with these new discoveries at the New York Botanical Garden. We now invite Sarah back to the stage for a shared conversation with Claire. And they will ask each other a few questions, and then we will sort of segue right into the audience Q&A. So please, audience, prepare your questions. And the, this Q&A session will be coordinated by my colleague, Charles Zimmerman. Here is Charles. Thank you, Vanessa. And thank you, Sarah and Claire, for your terrific presentations. 
Um, I'll let you get started with your questions in just a minute, but just a quick reminder to our audience to please check out the Q&A and post your questions there. Um, and if you see questions that others have already submitted that are a lot like your own or that you'd like to see answered, go ahead and thumbs up those questions so that we can prioritize them. Um, so I'll turn it over to Sarah and Clara. Shall I ask first? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> So you've been collecting historic US bulb catalogs for many years now, as you mentioned. Um, I'm wondering what the trends in offerings look like in times where importation to the US was limited. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Dutch elm disease or bulb disease in 1926, but uh, other instances of uh, being limited or restricted was World War One. So how long did market stagnation typically last and what did the market look like after those restrictions were lifted? What ended up, you have ebbs and flows starting in the late 1880s. One defining event was World War I and the, the Spanish flu pandemic, as it turns out. When the world recovered, and there was money flowing, people were able to buy, um, companies were able to bring on to market the new hybrids and people had the money to buy the new hybrids. So the old ones became cheap and quickly dropped out. And so starting in 1922 with John Skeepers and others, you have this whole new wave of the mid-teens new hybrids from England coming in. So up till then, those flowers were too expensive for American catalogs. After the Spanish flu in World War I, when the economies are rebounding, you have more people with more money, more gardening, and so you have this new roll of, of flowers coming in. When the embargo was on the horizon, the Dutch growers saw the writing on the wall, did not want to lose access to the American market. So they brought all their bulbs over and started growing them in American operations. The ax fell 1926. So everything that was in by 1926 stayed and nothing else particularly came in. And that held up until about World War II when restrictions were eased. At that point, the Dutch were in no position to start bringing on new flowers. Strangely enough, the New Zealanders and the Australians were, so a few high-end California firms were importing down under introductions around the beginning of World War II. World War II happens, everything collapses and grinds to a halt. After, by the early 1950s, Economies are recovering. The Dutch are looking for any cash inflow they can manage. They're in desperate straits. Everybody's in desperate straits. And so all of the new flowers that have been locked down, they start bringing on. All the Americans are tired of looking at the same thing for the past 20 years. And so all of the cultivars from the 20s and 30s, with few exceptions, just fall off the back burner. And you have the new the bright, the big, the showy, the ruffled, the big rim flares and rim rings, and it's big, bold, and showy. So there's a difference in the size and the poise and the complexity of the flowers before World War II and after World War II. And the same thing holds basically before and after World War I. It totally makes sense. Um, I have another question. <laughs> okay. I remember reading in uh, your book some ways of identifying an old daffodil versus a new by comparing their physical traits. So what are some of those telltale characteristics of an old daffodil? Assuming that your daffodil is well fed, because even newer varieties will dwindle in size and stature and we call it substance, the thickness of the petals. If the bulb is not well fed, it doesn't have the energy to put into making a top-notch flower, whatever flower it would produce. So 
assuming that you have a well-fed flower that's in a good sunny spot. Older flowers in general have narrower petals. They have less overlap. They twist a little more. They might hood as opposed to hold parallel a little more. They may have uh, more green. If it's a yellow flower, they might have more green in inching into the base of the petals. If it's white, it might have yellow inching up or it takes a while for the primrose yellow petal to fade to white. The colors are um, more saturated with time. Uh, they're more, in, they bleed more into the corona. So starting from the beginning, there's this push to make a flower that instead of nods, straighten up and look at you. From skinny willowy petals to something big and thick that so when you're looking at it, you're really looking at more as opposed to less that the coronas, instead of being crinkly and wobbly and kind of small, are bigger, better formed, uh, smoother, less ridged. Uh, and taking out or solidifying the colors, the permanent colors, so less fade. So if it's going to be white, that it opens white. It doesn't open cream or yellow and then fade or the petals open kind of primrose and then fade. So if you have a flower that takes three or four days to become a mature flower, so it looks like one thing when it opens and four days later, it looks like something else, that's a signal of an older flower. There's more genetic variability going on. They react more to the weather, to the, to the uh, season of the year, um, whereas a uh, later hybrid, uh, that variability has been bred out and the characteristics that they wanted are much more stable. So what opens is what you get. And that's part of the problem with identifying historics is you have to go back and look. So people will say, oh, what's this flower? And I go, well, you know, I think it could be this, but send me a photo in three days or four days. Well, let's see what it turns into. And these people are sending me yellow and orange flowers that four days later are really white and yellow. Mm -hmm. So you have, so with the embankment or any other unknown flowers, we have to go back and go back and go back. And, you know, you really wish you could stick flags out, you know, hot pink flags with like color codes and, you know, this is this and this is that, but people really don't like looking at all the little pink flags. So, like, what do I do? <laughs> so I'm now to the point where I take pink flagging and I tie it around the base of the plant so that when you look, you don't see anything. But if you know mm -hmm. sort of where you're going, you've got your pink flag in your note, because if you're in a mixed environment, what's here and what's six or eight inches over can be completely different. So you've got to tag the actual yeah. flower that you're seeing and keep track of that because it's neighbor, maybe, you know, a 10 year different hybrid and a different color code. So if you go so to dig true. and reset, you're going to wonder why your yellow white turned out to be orange yellow. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm very excited for this mapping project to happen because it's really hard to go revisit these historics that are mixed in, I think it's nine, about nine acres of just mixed naturalized planting. It's just very, very hard to find them it's again. Yeah, it's really, really pretty and really, really annoying. And if you're into the position yes. where you have some cultivars that are more robust than others, and so over your decades mm -hmm. have um, multiplied uh, by bulb division to the point where you have a large clump, you know, you can only fertilize so much to offset the fact that those bulbs are stripping the nutrition out of the soil because they don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. At some point, you've got to dig and divide. Well, then you need to know where your one clump is so that you get the ones that you need to dig and divide and you know exactly what you've got and you don't pick up its neighbor clump. And um, again, that's with Flowerland helping the, uh, the condo association now because the new people are interested in preserving that planting. We're going to be looking at how, what kind of flagging system can the residents tolerate that doesn't irritate them from year to year because your flagging system has to hold 
after the daffodils mm -hmm. go. I mean, it's kind of pointless if you've got to go out and reinvent the wheel every March. I mean, it defeats the purpose. So how do you come up with a permanent marking system so you know, okay, my Peter Bar trumpets, which are really rare, are doing well, or hey, this year they didn't bloom, if you can't go find them again. Yeah. So... This has been fantastic. Thank you for sharing all of this. I think our audience really appreciates it. Um, we've had a lot of great questions come in from the audience Q&A. So I'd like to transition over and make sure that some of those get answered. Um, just to start off with, a lot of people were really curious just the basic difference between daffodils, jonquils, and narcissus. If one of you could just, just say that briefly so that we all understand are on the same page. Um, I can give you the Southern explanation or I can give you the, and I'll give you the Southern explanation and then I'll give you the, the, the botanical explanation. The Southern explanation is, is a narcissus is what you grow. The jonquil is what your grandmama had and the daffodil is the thing in the catalog that dies in your yard. Technically, narcissus is the genus name. It became a common name particularly when people didn't remember the name of whatever it was that they bought or their, their grandmother knew, but they didn't. So Narcissus became a catch-all, particularly for Tizetas. Jonquils, again, are a botanic name for the section of Jonquilla, which are yellow, fragrant. Um, they like it dry. They come from the um, Iberian Peninsula in particular, so they like a dry summer and a wet winter. Um, but people didn't remember the names, and so everything became a jonquil. Daffodil is the accepted English term for all the flowers in the genus Narcissus. So when you get into the daffodil world, Narcissus is usually a catch-all in a botanic sense, and daffodil is the word catch-all in a common flower sense. Terrific. Thank you so much for clearing that up. Um, a lot of folks were interested more in the wild planted bulbs. Um, how long do these typically survive when they're not being tended to, I imagine, especially? And uh, do the wild planted bulbs, do they continue to reproduce? And then furthermore, do they hybridize with each other once, we're out, once they're out there? Claire, you want me to take this one? Yeah. Okay, so if they are treated well, if they are not mowed too soon, if they're left to become a grassland planting and then when you start to mow grass in the early summer and you leave your foliage to, quote, ripen, and you are not removing the material so that you, if you think about it, soil nutrition is designed to be a closed loop system so that the leaves that fall become the nutrients for the plant the next season. So if you still maintain that, rather than stripping all those nutrients away by raking or taking your dead foliage away, all that sort of thing, then the daffodils will settle into a stasis mode and they will, and the, the more robust ones will continue to divide. And so yes, that field out of um, uh, Jane Hill's uh, daffodils out in the, the field were planted before 1910, the current owners understand that occasionally they'll run through with a bag of fertilizer but they don't mow too early and because it was always treated as farmland the daffodils have held same with flower land and same with new york botanic garden if they are fat and happy and fertile they will cross pollinate and set seed and we're now having that issue at flower land because we've had two very wet years so the seeds have managed to over make it through the dry it wasn't a dry summer it was a damp summer kept the seeds viable and they've come up through the leaf litter and so now all of a sudden there are all these little hybrids that some are a year old and some are two years old and uh, my compatriot and i are looking at each other going uh whoops because you have no idea what you're going to get and in seven years you're going to have flowers that you are going to not be able to identify because they are hybrids and you will not have any idea you might have a wild guess who the seed parent was because it's downhill, but you will not have an idea who the pollen parent was. And so when you get into these situations, part of Claire's pain and suffering might be that 
she's got hybrids. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I have no doubt about that. And so then what do you do with your hybrids? Do you appreciate this original planting for what it was and you leave them? Or are you in a position where you need to preserve the original integrity of the landscape planting and you need to remove them? So what people do who, uh, like one of the gardens is a private garden, but he's trying to amass a large historic collection is that every season he runs around and he deadheads all of his flowers so they don't set seed so that he preserves the um, integrity of his original plantings. And he doesn't have, you know, juniors hanging out next door that are about six inches away that look kind of like mom and dad, but not too much. And he's going, you know, what is this? And so he has missed a few and he's sending photos and they're just different enough that if you didn't know any better, you would drive yourself insane trying to identify them because they're a brand new flower. Mm -hmm. So deadheading is the way to go. To maintain these things, uh, you have to maintain a fertilizer level, you have to maintain a non-mowing policy, and then you get into issues of thinning. And there you, you just have to, to grit it out. Thank you. Some of our um, audience members had questions about mowing and things like that as well. So I think you helped answer some of that. Um, here's a question talking a little bit, going back even farther. Um, are there centers of diversity around the world where wild daffodils really have a strong presence? Um, those habitats that they maybe are from, what are those habitats like? And thinking about the genetics of all this can DNA be used to, to look back even farther and understand these um, daffodils in their origins? Okay, well, I'm gonna do the DNA first. Um, DNA has come down in price. So yes, people are doing DNA. There have been some very interesting papers coming out that the DNA and the plant morphology are not telling the same tale. Daffodils as a plant are very old. They're an old adaptation to uh, ex climatic extremes of uh, usually wet winters and dry summers. Daffodils are found around, or the genus Narcissus, let's be correct. Uh, the genus Narcissus is found around the Mediterranean basin uh, from the lowlands and the marshlands up to the tops of the mountains. So how your curtain garden daffodil does for you has something to do with its genetic heritage Poets are alpine meadow plants. Then you have Cyclamineus and Triandrus that came from the side of the mountain and like the granite scree. So they like it a little cool, but they like it dry. Then you have the Tazettas and the Jonquils, which came from the lowlands, who like lots of water and are not terribly cold hardy. Uh, you have uh, Tazettas uh, from southern France, Italy, over to the Levant. And then you have a few Tazettas and some other interesting bulbs that come from North Africa. Uh, Spain is one place where people go to go species sleuthing. Uh, the Alps are another. Uh, and uh, they're starting to try to do work in Algeria. And then there are people in Israel and who uh, sleuth through from Turkey uh, all the way over to Afghanistan. Um, and I forgot now the first part of the question. How's that? <laughs> I, I think you got to most of it, actually. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this has been great. Um, uh, we're reaching the end of the hour. Um, thank you all for being patient and for joining us for this time. Um, I'll ask one more question. Uh, this was partially answered in the Q&A already, but I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to hear it out loud. Uh, Claire, can you tell us just a little bit about how participants can enjoy <clears throat> daffodils at the Botanical Garden, where they might go, what parts they can find these historic varieties? Right, so we, we have daffodils all around the garden. Um, we have two really big collections, one in Lyason Valley, which is near uh, the Mertz Library, and then there's Daffodil Hill and the surrounding areas. Um, for Lyason Valley, it's really just the paved pathways that you should be walking on unless, you know, you want to go inspect a label to see what cultivar you're looking at. But we do really want to um, maintain the integrity of the plantings and, and not compact the ground too much. 
Uh, for Daffodil Hill, we do have mode pathways, which you are allowed to walk on. Um, but as far as going into the planting, we discourage that because um, it really does kind of damage the collection. Um, yeah, it's if you could stay on the pathways, that would be wonderful. Um, but we also have a uh, Daffodil web page, which I believe Charles entered into the chat earlier, which you can explore. Uh, it covers a little bit of history of Daffodil Hill. Um, it also features the daffodils in Daffodil Hill. So it has like little profile pictures. If you can't visit in person, you can more than uh, you are more than welcome to visit them online. Terrific. Thank you, Claire. Um, at this point, I'll transition it to Vanessa. I think we're ready to close up for the day. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Charles. The hour has really flown by. There are more questions, but alas, we are out of time. Uh, Sarah and Claire, thank you so much again for sharing with us your incredible knowledge of daffodils and for deepening our understanding of this amazing bulb. And thank you to our audience for joining us today for this webinar. If, if you missed any part of it or would like to see it again, uh, it will be saved and shared online in the New York Botanical Garden Lecture Library. Lastly, uh, to close, a quick overview about uh, of uh, upcoming programs you may be interested in. Next week on April 8th and 9th, the New York Botanical Garden partners with other botanical gardens around the world, as well as museums and universities to engage the public in citizen science. During the WeDig Bio event, we invite you to help mobilize biodiversity data from preserved herbarium specimens, and doing that, advanced scientific understanding of the plants of our world. And you can join us for a series of virtual events, including research talks by contemporary botanists, and you get also a tour of the Botanical Garden's remarkable scientific collection, and see how you can participate online um, in projects that support our mission to preserve and protect the planet's biodiversity. On April 16th, you can lear learn more about the evolutionary development of seed plants when our doctoral candidate, Cecilia Tsumayo, will share the results of her PhD research at NYBG. And finally, on April 22nd, we celebrate Earth Day and we have a premiere of an um, important new documentary on the conservation of plants, people and culture on the island of Vanuatu in the Pacific Archipelago, followed by a conversation with the project's collaborators from Vanuatu and from the New York Botanical Garden. And if you haven't registered already, please go ahead and do so. There will be a link in the chat at the end. And now, um, thank you all very much again, and thank you audience for joining us. Until next time, stay well, take good care of yourself, and goodbye everyone. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye.